Angus Fletcher is the closest to me. He is the head of marketing, advocacy, and business strategy at Deutsche Bank. Also with us, Stuart Macbeth, general manager, MD, Deriv, serve at the DTCC. And uh, John Wilson is a global head of OTC Clearing at New Edge. Thanks to all of you for joining us. I was telling them earlier when they were getting mic'd up before we ran the titles that you guys have been the most animated group that, uh, that has been here. So I'm expecting big things from you. Okay, so let's start with you, Angus, first of all. I mean, securities regulation, very broad topic. If you can just summarize for us what have been the main regulations that the securities issue have been grappling with and have to grapple with. Okay, so as you say, it's hugely broad. Um, on the derivative side, predominantly it's Dodd-Frank and EMIR, mm -hmm. uh, which is the European uh, version of, of that derivatives regulation. Um, on top of that, you've got MIFID um, two coming around the corner. We've got CSD regulation. Uh, we've got Target 2 for securities, which isn't a regulation, but is a European um, project that's been going on, driven by the European Central Bank to harmonize settlement um, at, at a CSD level, and that's due to go live in 2015 or as a first wave. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then around that, you've also got C CPS IOSCO standards uh, looking at, that will then need to be uh, subscribed into, uh, reg into local legislation as well mm -hmm. around recovery and resolution for credit institutions and for, um, and for financial market infrastructures. We've got CRD4 and CRR, <laughs> um, which again looks from a capital, um, uh, capital and risk basis, and again, that has a huge impact into this space. Um, I could keep talking. I know, we could keep going when we talk about regulation. Let's, uh, if you can pinpoint for me, what have been the main challenges, the main sticking points, the pain points, as people try to grapple with all of these regulations? So I think the pain points, you know, predominantly, uh, as we discussed on the panel this morning, the main objectives that the regulators have are by and large the same. You know, mm -hmm. They've all agreed them at G20 level, um, and particularly in the derivative space, it's reducing systemic risk, it's uh, re making sure investors uh, are protected at all costs. Um, and that's fed, fed through into, the, into the, the legislation that's very much driving a view of moving as much uh, derivative business into central counterparties, um, so away from uh, bilateral counterparty risk management to central counterparty risk management. It's around collateralization of those uh, uh, trades um, and types of, types of activity. And it's about reporting of that activity into trade repositories. Um, so, which all sounds like the broad, broadly the same, but it's then, it, the devil is in the interpretation as to, and the implementation as to how each of those particular jurisdictions tries to then impose their regulatory framework on, let's be honest, what are cross-border institutions and cross-border processes. Mm -hmm. um, they don't, no regulator, and you can totally understand it, wants a fail on their watch. Mm -hmm. And if their particular business is uh, as much going on overseas as it is on their own, uh, what is within their own boundaries, they want to be able to manage that risk um, o o on a cross-border basis at mm -hmm. the same time. And it's here is where the, the real clash uh, uh, appears. And mm -hmm. it's how institutions like ourselves who are who are in the mix and mm -hmm. completely at the center of this mm -hmm. are actually trying to deal with those, those challenges and for our clients as well. So let's go to Stuart and John because you guys sit on the OTC derivative side reporting and um, clearing, mm -hmm. is that correct? Uh, correct. So how are you, you're, you're, you're trying to manage these clashes, how is that impacting, what are the things you're trying to do? So from a reporting perspective, uh, we, yeah, as, as Angus has explained, we started with a, a global objective that was set out by the G20 to report all OTC derivatives to uh, trade repositories. Now, that sounds relatively simple, but what's really happened is each jurisdiction has now gone in and devised their own rules, their own formats for those reports, mm -hmm. uh, and started the process of implementation. And that process of implementation has taken a long time. We've been working with firms since the early part of 2010 to prepare for this, and only now are we getting across the jurisdictions to a, to a fuller implementation. 
So the, the first phase has been working to Im implement a series of slightly different reforms in each country that has come down through a legislative process into a regulatory process, having preempted some of that and started the work earlier. The next phase we're moving into is one about access for regulators mm -hmm. to that data, which is something, again, they're struggling with, and they've actually embedded certain barriers in their legislation to sharing. Um, some of them were reciprocal provisions because they saw other jurisdictions with, with rules that they did not like, and they put up certain, certain barriers. And now they're going to have to work fairly closely to try and remove those barriers and ensure a level playing field to access the data. And the, the, the third problem they've now hit upon is really an aggregation one of this data. So service providers like myself who act as a trade repository, there's been a proliferation in numbers, potential vendors, and the regulators have come to realize they're going to receive it from many sources, this data. So now they have to work out how they themselves are going to aggregate and usefully use the data. And so we've, you know, we've found ourselves in a situation where there was a very broad systemic risk objective that was about the entire global market, about its connectedness mm -hmm. and how transactions flow across borders. We've ended up with a very um, regional implementation that isn't really giving them the result that they need. They've got mm -hmm. an awful lot of data, now they really need to turn it into information and we're just getting to that stage now where they're actually starting to think about how we derive information rather than just data. Mm -hmm. So, so Stuart was talking about the regionalization and you're right when you asked your question that, that both Stuart and I look like the beneficiaries mm -hmm. of this regulation and should be thrilled and indeed there are, certainly from my perspective for clearing, many benefits coming to bear simply because, as an example, a client now does not have to worry to the same extent about the credit risk of their counterparty because shortly after the trade is done they won't face that counterparty. So some positives coming out of that. But Back to Stuart's point, the, the concern is that we're, we're possibly going to see a retrenchment away from the international trade that we have become used to back into more regional focused activity. And that's because whilst, as Angus pointed out, the regulators have set out a common set of objectives, their interpretations of how they might achieve that are varied. Mm -hmm. And some are moving faster than others, and that's also causing some friction um, over what they would call a comparability of regimes. Mm -hmm. And so I think generally for the, for the viewers, you're, you're going to find that many of them are confused about what needs to be done by when in which jurisdiction. And whilst firms like all of our respective organizations can, can help them with that, one of the, the key issues will be, do we end up in a marketplace whereby regulatory barriers actually frustrate the ability um, of the world markets to be able to disseminate risks to the places most appropriate and actually concentrate it into small market infrastructures um, which may or may not be well suited to handle that problem. Mm -hmm. And, and then of course, because of the different interpretations, as you say, uh, and the fact that some people are doing it quicker than others, where you've mentioned that friction, there's some people that are gaining competitive advantage really quite uh, you know, rapidly at the moment, while the others are still trying to grapple with it. So talk to us a little bit about these well, kinds of friction. That's an it depends. Mm -hmm. This is a double-edged sword in terms of competitive advantage. Uh, one might say that the, the US is competitively disadvantaged by having gone faster and further than others. And I'll give you an example of that. So uh, I was recently speaking at a buy side event where the audience were asked the question, um, how many of you as, as European institutions will continue to trade with American institutions? And 82% of that large buy side audience said they would prefer not to do business with US firms now, simply because they did not want to be ensnared and trapped in US mm -hmm. regulation in terms of Dodd-Frank. Mm -hmm. And that in itself tells you that's a profound, profound shift. Now, arguably, it benefits uh, organizations like ourselves, which are our European headquartered. But conversely, for the, for the wider market uh, as a whole, it now means those buy-side firms, arguably, will have fewer counterparties to deal with. Mm -hmm. So that's probably um, a, a downside to this. Some might say Asia's benefiting because they've stayed further behind, watched others go their own way uh, and we'll pick, cherry pick the best of it. Mm. I, I think what we've seen is that the way in which regulation is developing, um, the tension between jurisdictions means it's actually quite hard for there to be any arbitrage opportunity mm -hmm. and for anyone really to get a better advantage from anyone else. Mm -hmm. Do you want to come back? Um, yeah, I, 
I think I agree um, in, in many ways. I think part of the problem is there is no framework for delivery of this regulation. There, there are different regulators moving at different speeds. I mean, if you take, just look at EMEA, the, the deadline for uh, when OTC derivative reporting needed to start has just moved back to, uh, to end February. We're still waiting for DTCC to be mm -hmm. an improved uh, repository. Um, and you know, I know that a large number of firms uh, will have said under Dodd-Frank, that's where we're reporting. We want to be able to use DTCC in order to be able to report for, um, for EMIR purposes as well. So there's this level of uncertainty that sits there. All of our organizations and our customers' organizations, by and large, you, you, you have a budget process mm -hmm. that you have to develop and build systems to, and there's a lead time by which mm -hmm. you have to do that. And the dates get closer and closer, and you have to deliver to that lead time, and then suddenly they move again. Mm -hmm. um, it makes it very, very difficult, number one, to keep the customer base informed of what they need to be doing and by when, and they because there's a sometimes an assumption. Well, the dates will just move again, so maybe we don't need, we need to comply. To do and I think that's a very that's a dangerous approach to take because at some point those dates will firm up and that'll be it. Mm -hmm. um, but you never know when that's going to be. So I think that's one um, one aspect. But as I say, the other is is how you therefore project manage and program manage your your build has to remain adaptable and you've got to get to a point where you can, I, it's this hot word called agile, mm -hmm. um, but basically what that means is you've got to build down a certain path and and then adjust as you go along to um, as the, the regulations change. Mm -hmm. So having the likes of, I suppose, ourselves from an advocacy point of view tied into what's going on in the market with your program team internally is a critical thing that we would say, you know, all our customers and counterparts need to look at because it's making sure you can align up where you need to, uh, to get the right messages from the market and understanding from the market to be able to deliver. So what should be the call to action now? You're here with Swift as a cooperative. What kind of role can they play or are they playing and can continue to play to better uh, to make things better? So, so uh, we, we've certainly seen uh, an organization like, like Swift look to offer parts of the solution and leverage existing products they have uh, to try and fulfill some of the needs. So you know, clearly all of this change in the market actually moves transactions and to be electronic message events, mm -hmm. and it's a natural space for, for an organization like Swift. Um, Swift is kind of uniquely positioned because it's not heavily into, into the regulated sphere, mm -hmm. it's stayed away from that, but it certainly can help bring the data together and, and connect the infrastructures is, is really where I think it sees its primary role in this. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily, I think, well certain other of the future legislation it will be more heavily involved in. So you know, maybe, maybe less so derivatives, but particularly the securities regulation and a lot of things to do with moving collateral will be a, a sweet spot for Swift. Okay. And, and to Stuart's point on the, on the moving collateral, um, one of the things that, that regulation has put a great emphasis on is collateral. Uh, and yet, sadly, um, we're, we're going to see a scenario in which, because there are so many competing demands for collateral from regulation, there has been talk, uh, and, and indeed I subscribe to this view, that there may indeed be a shortage uh, of collateral. Or, or less than a shortage, just it's in the wrong places. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so some of the interesting things I think during the course of this week at Cyboss will be to hear what innovations are coming around to try and help collateral flow, flow more freely. Because examples um, in my own environment are in the clearing world, clearing houses will be taking in collateral to guard against risk. They use it as an initial margin to insulate themselves against the risk of the, the, the members and, and the end clients defaulting. But all of these absorptions of collateral in, in the various guises of regulation actually take it out of circulation. And if you take it out of circulation, it's arguably taking money out of the money system. Mm -hmm. um, and that could have some fairly profound macro policy impacts uh, down the line. Uh, and I think there's a lot of challenge for people to try and address that. Um, I, th I think the other aspect on collateral is we talk a lot about securities collateral. If you actually look at what collateral is moved at the moment, m vast majority is cash still. And I fully recognize that you know, we do need to be able to utilize traps, collateral or, or securities assets. But if you're a CCP or any other player, you, um, you, when you take collateral, you want to be able to liquidize mm -hmm. it 
very quickly and easily. And cash is very important in that. And I sometimes think the debate is always about securities. I think we also need to think more around how can we utilize the cash world, the cash payment infrastructures and so on in this space um, in, in order to, to utilize that. In particular, when we start looking at CRD and CRR as well around cash balances, et cetera. And arguably, the, the, the thing we have to keep remembering is we're going to have to innovate because the costs are going up, yep. mm -hmm. okay? And unless we can be smarter about the way in which we do business, then who's going to get hurt? You are. You specifically are going to get hurt Me. because your pension yeah. plan <laughs> is going to get battered. <laughs> okay. Why? Because the cost of regulation doesn't end up coming out of our bottom line, it comes, comes out, out of the of investor's it. bottom line. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we have to keep thinking about. When all of this regulation's coming through, and both get the regulators to think about it, and indeed our respective organizations, is how can we do this more efficiently? How can we do it cheaper but safely? Because otherwise, in 20 years time, that pension's not looking so good, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's looking great now, my pension, so <laughs> you better work it out. Thanks very all much right. for joining all of us today. We, that's all we've got time for, but it's great to see you all. Thanks very much.